Well, hello, Paul Donovan here, pastor at Good News Church. And today I want to share with you something that I read in my Bible notes the other week. And uh, I knew, I thought it'd be particularly good for us at this point in time and saved it for such a time as this. So here we are. And before I read it, I want to mention to you the Bible that I use for my personal uh, quiet times, my readings on a morning. It's an ESV version. And it's called the Gospel Transformation Bible. And I really recommend it to you because the notes in the bottom section help us to see how the whole of the Bible relates to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And uh, they're very, very helpful. So I'm going to read some of those notes to you today. And it's based on Genesis 21. Let me read to you the first two verses of that chapter. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. So Abraham was promised a son, but he and Sarah had to wait a long time. And this is what the notes say. After all the promises raising Abraham's expectations of a large family, the fulfilment of God's word is singularly brief. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he promised. And so Isaac is born. And the notes say this, the promise of offspring that's detailed in Genesis 12 to 20, is being fulfilled. But Abraham's joy is cut short by four troubling incidents. First of all, the rivalry between Ishmael, that's the son that Abraham had in uh, him and Sarah's impatience. She gave Hagar, her maidservant, to Abraham, and she had Ishmael, who by the time of Isaac's birth is uh, 13, I think, from memory. And that causes rivalry. Secondly, the rivalry and distrust from Abimelech. Thirdly, the command then later on in Isaac's life to sacrifice Isaac, to go up the mountain and to sacrifice him. Uh, and then the fourth troubling incident, the death of of Sarah. All his life Abraham awaited the birth of his child, but the laughter, that's what Isaac means, uh, read that in chapter 17 verse 17, soon turned to pain. Abraham's experience prepared God's people for the birth of the Messiah, who came to save his people from their sins whose birth and life were also associated with pain and suffering. Such is the way God works out his promises in the lives of his people. Pain is normally the channel through which divine blessing and favour flows. For it is pain that brings us truly to trust in the Lord. It is adversity that convinces us of the emptiness of the things of the world that the world runs after. Suffering is God's fatherly way of drawing us to himself. I think that's so important for us to remember. Everybody's going through particular suffering at the moment with COVID-19. Uh, the, the isolation, the separation from loved ones, the threats to our employment, uh, the restrictions in our activities, the, the feelings of uh, being alone, and on and on it goes, as well as the, the literal, if you catch COVID, the, the suffering of illness and potentially of hospitalisation and even of dying. But on top of COVID, life has lots of other trials, doesn't it? But God uses those things to show us his fatherly love, to, to show us that he is to be our hope 
He is to be the one that we trust in. And when we trust him, we will know that he has a plan and a purpose through it all. And he uses even the most difficult things in life together for our good and for his glory. The writer goes on, indeed, it was pain, supreme pain, that achieved the fulfillment of God's promise to his people to bless them and to be with them. So Abraham had had that promise from God, I will be with you. And I'll make you into a great nation. But ultimately, those promises are fulfilled through Jesus. And God's promise is to be their God. Uh, as they were his people, to multiply them, to give them long life in the land. For all the promises of God were achieved not through a victorious military campaign or sufficient human obedience or other humanly generated strategy, but through a cross. And they reference 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. And with that, I'll close. Paul says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But, says Paul, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ crucified is the power and the wisdom of God. It is through that supreme suffering that we know the ultimate love of God as we come to faith in Jesus. And then through the trials of this life, which in eternity future, we will look back and look at as momentary. We will see that God in his fatherly care had a purpose and a plan through all of the trials and the tribulations. Our place now, like Abraham and Sarah, is to trust him. Let's pray and ask him to do that. Help us in that, shall we? Father, we are weak. We like things to be easy and plain sailing. But we thank you that you are God over all. We thank you, Lord, that in this broken world where we will experience trials of many different forms, that you love us, that you hold us, that you are faithful, that we can rely upon you, that you are all wise, all knowing. God, in those times when we feel desperate, when we feel like you're not holding to your promises, when we feel like life is falling apart, when we feel hopeless and helpless, would you show us your love, your faithfulness? And would you give us strength? Would you give us faith to hold on to you and to wait to see the fulfillment of your plans? We thank you in Jesus that he persevered to the end. He went through the suffering and came through to that glorious resurrection and ascending into heaven. Lord, help us to hold on, to see it through to the victorious end. And thank you that you're with us every moment of the way. Amen.